Okay, hold on. All right, lights, camera, action. Welcome back. Whew, it's been a crazy couple days. Um, let me just say right off the bat that if you sent me an email in the past few days and I was delayed in responding to it, my apologies. Been like a human ping pong ball these past couple days, um, but our uh, ABET visit was going on uh, for the past couple days. So I've been pretty busy. But that's over, and we're back to structural analysis. So, let me give you a little bit of a rundown of where we're at. Um, in terms of homework assignments, um, uh, everything's graded except for 5.7 um, and 6.1 was due today. The honest reason that 5.7 graded was, <laughs> was my fault because I didn't get the solution to my TA because I was busy. So uh, I gave her both the uh, solutions to um, 5.7 and 6.1, told her 6.1 was due today. So she's got both of those. Um, the solution to 5.7, though, should be up now. Okay. Um, 6.2. First, first off, before we talk about 6.2, how did homework 6.1 go? That was a homework I assigned while we were totally, you know, not together as a class, and it was due today. So how'd that go? Was that straightforward? Any questions yet? The moment function? So you're asking if you needed to plot it. You know you didn't need to. No. no. Um, that's fine. You don't have to construct the... Um, the shear and moment diagrams to generate the shear and moment functions, you, or the moment functions. You don't need the shear functions, um, but I know you don't have to. Now, for what we do today, it is also not necessary, but maybe a tad more beneficial because there's a lot more of them. Okay, so there's multiple moment functions for the problems we're doing today. If you're good with homework 6.1, 6.2, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, is like a longer version of 6.1. It is arguably the longest homework assignment we have in here, so much that I'm not making it due Friday. I'm making it due Monday. Um, there is nothing to prevent you from starting this assignment after lecture today. That being said, um, you might not want to dive too far down the rabbit hole until after lecture on Friday because the Friday lecture is – tips and tricks to make these problems easier, okay? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so there's that. One final thing, I want to talk about the project. I have not yet graded submission one, but my goal is to get that graded sometime next week, and then I will provide you specific um, uh, CAD requirements, calculation requirements, et cetera, so you know what you're getting into for submission two, which again, isn't due until the week before Thanksgiving, so we got plenty of time on that. I just wanted to let you know where we're at on stuff. Everybody okay with this? Okay. All right. So here's the deal. Virtual work for beam deflection. So what we're doing when we do virtual work is we're, just like with trusses, we're summing up the energy inside the system. Okay. Um, now with trusses, we were summing up the energy from axial deformation. So we're using you know, like for mechanics, it was PL over EA. We're using little f, big FL over EA. We're summing those up for every trust member. And that, and we're summing up a, a scalar. We're summing up a number for each trust member because the forces were constant along the length of the member, right? So in a trust member or in a trust analysis, when you look at this member of the trust and you say it's 50 kips in compression, it's 50 kips in compression along the entire length of the member. It doesn't change from one end of the member to the other. So we can just sum up the numbers and call it a day. But with beams, that's not the case. With beams, the moment changes as a function of x. You get moment diagrams that look like this. It's not just, you know, the moment is five across the, uh, the, the beam. It's all over the place. So we have to sum up the energy, and that means integrating. So instead of summing little m big M L over EI, we're integrating little m big M over EI uh, across the applicable ranges and summing up those integrals. Um, <clears throat> so it still requires two analyses, a real analysis and a virtual analysis. Um, we need the E and the I. Um, hopefully from the uh, uh, virtual lectures, you recognize that we do still have a units problem to deal with because the structural geometry tends to be referenced in terms of feet. You know, like the member is 
or the beam's 30 foot long, the loads are kips per foot, the moments are foot kips, but then the uh, material properties and the section properties tend to be referred to in inches. You know, the Young's modulus is 20,000 KSI. The moment of inertia is 3,000 inches to the fourth, what have you. So we need conversion factors. We use 1728 for deflections because it's basically we're having to throw a 12 in three times. Uh, and we use 144 for rotations, but because we want our rotations and maybe maybe some more usable numbers, we, we like them in degrees, so we take 144, but then we throw a 180 over pi in there so we get it in degrees. If you wanted your rotations in radians, just eliminate the 180 over pi. Okay. Okay. Now, the previous example that we did was dealing with problems with a single moment function. So those cantilevered beams were, were designed to be easy from a, from a concept standpoint. But they're not hyper-realistic. Um, what I want uh, is to do a little bit more of a real problem. And so we're gonna, uh, I want to start looking at something that's a little funkier, maybe something like this. Okay? Um, so in order to do this, we just have to separate our integrals and sum them up accordingly. So maybe like for a beam like this, uh, the beam is, let's see, 12, 20, is 32, 6, 38 feet long. So what I might have is one integral that goes from 0 to 12, one integral that goes from 12 to 32, and one integral that goes from 32 to uh, 38, you know, and just sum up the responses from each of those integrals, okay? So it's, it's not harder, it's just bookkeeping, okay? And remember, uh, just about every student in here should have a scientific or graphing calculator that can do this integration for you. Um, this is not calculus. This is structural analysis. I don't have a problem if you do that. I need you to set up the integrals correctly. After that, it just becomes the plug and chug process. Okay, so we're going to do this beam. Um, I have a beam with a uniformly distributed load, um, and we are going to determine the vertical deflection uh, and rotation. We might not get to the rotation simply uh, because of time, but if you understand how to do the uh, deflection, you understand how to do the rotation. We're going to determine the, uh, the deformations at point B uh, on the beam shown using the principle of virtual work. And we're going to say that E, the Young's modulus for this beam, is 4,000 KSI. So this beam is akin to concrete. It's more probably a concrete beam as opposed to a steel beam. And so whenever you have concrete beams, concrete beams just tend to be bigger than steel beams um, because what we're really interested in is the EI being uh, consistent across. So because steel is such a strong, much more strong material, we can use smaller steel beams. If you look at a steel beam and its concrete counterpart, the concrete counterpart is just big, you know. But because that's because the concrete per unit volume is weaker than the steel. So that's why we have to use more of it. Um, now what we're doing is we're determining deflection right here. Okay. And we're probably not going to do this. <coughs> we're probably not going to do this for this example. But uh, we're determining deflection right here, which is 10 foot from A. So the idea is that our, our, our moment uh, function, our, our virtual moment functions, our integration is going to sort of be centered around this point where x equals 10. You know? What I could do is I could say, what about instead of x equals 10, I make the, uh, the point of interest x equals A. Like I pick some random point here A, and I integrate that way. It's going to be a lot more alphabet soup, but in the end, instead of getting deflection at a given point, I would be getting deflection as a function of A, so I'd be getting deflection at any point. So, um, and I like to use the letter A because I don't like to mix up my A's and X's. I just treat uh, A as a constant like everything else and let the calculus work itself out. Okay. All right. Tent library. Deflection example two. All right, that is kind of big. Make that a little smaller. Boom. Okay. So what we're going to do first off is we're going to deal with the real structure. Okay. Let's deal with the real structure. All right. Now, look, we're in lecture 25 in structural analysis, so I'm hoping there's some things we can do kind of quickly. Um, I have 1.2 kips per foot applied on a beam that's 30 foot long. If I collapse that into a point load, how much is that going to be? Say it again? 36. Okay. And where is that going to act? So left or the right. So you're saying right smack dab in the middle. So if I got 36 kips right smack dab in the middle of this beam, what are the reactions on either end? 
18. Okay. So would you agree with me that if we're looking at the real structure and we'll call that M of X, would you agree that AY equals CY equals That, would you agree with that? 1.2 kips per foot over 30 feet and then just cut it in half. And the reason why is because it's symmetric, okay? If you are a purist and you need to some moments here to determine that reaction and then some forces to get the other action, go ahead, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. Um, but hopefully you recognize that this is a symmetric structure. Everybody okay with that? So I propose that the reaction for this structure is 18 kips. So this reaction here is 18 kips. 18 kips. Now, if you understood homework 6.1, let me ask you a question. How many moment functions do I need to fully define the moment diagram for this beam? Anybody remember my little trick for determining how many moment functions you need? Remember what I would do is I would say, you know, take, sort of like take, take a sheet of paper and sort of like start sliding it this way. And whenever you see something new, you need a new moment function. How many moment functions do we need to fully define the moment on this, uh, this beam? One. Now, if you're unsure of that, let's graphically construct it. So what does that look like? So, go like that, and how do I construct the shear diagram, right? So, let's do the shear diagram, All right? So, I start at zero, I jump up 18, right? And if I'm at 18, how far do I go down from here to here? 36, right? 1.2 kips per foot for a distance of 30 feet is 36. So if I'm at 18, I go down 36, that puts me at negative 18, right? So negative 18. And that reaction brings me back up to zero, right? Now what's the area of these triangles? One half of 18 times what? What's this distance? 15, right? This dimension is 15 feet. So what's 1 half 18 times 15? Say it again? No, 1 half of 18 times 15. So 1 half of 18 is 9. What's 9 times 15? 135. So this is plus 135, this is negative 135. So really what we've got is here's our moment diagram and we start at zero and how does this work? We go a lot to a little and then a little to a lot and it just happens to peak right there in the middle at 135. And that's our moment diagram, right? So our moment diagram is actually just one parabola. It just peaks in the center at 135. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is another reason for constructing the graphical moment diagram. So you can kind of go, okay, I only need one function, right? You can take that function, pop it in Excel, and see if it looks the way it's supposed to, right? Now, in order to generate that function, I am going to cut a section, and I'm cutting the section at an arbitrary point. I'm not cutting it at B, I'm just cutting it at some random point uh, along the structure. And I'm going to cut a section, I'm going to look left, okay? All right, there is a reason I'm looking left. There is a reason, trust me. I will, I will explain it later, but for the sake of discussion, just trust me. I'm cutting a section looking left. So 
here's the structure looking left. All right, so this is 1.2 kips per foot, and we idealize that as a single point load, that is 1.2x, right, at a distance of x over 2. Am I going too fast, or are we good with this? Hopefully by now this is pretty straightforward, right? So what I can do is I can say if I sum moments at the cut, I have 18x over here, m, and then 1.2x times x over 2 here. And then I get this. M is or uh, M plus 0.6x squared is 18x, and so what I then do is say M of x is 18x minus 0.6x squared. If I went too fast, tell me. But is everybody okay with this? Now, I want to know something right now. What is the range of applicability for that function? Okay, say it again. The whole thing. And what is the whole thing? It is from x equals 0 to x equals what? 30. Right? Because the whole beam is 30 foot long. Right? And that function will give me the moment across the entire span. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write 0, 30 right next to that function. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? In fact, why don't I just put this over here on the whiteboard just so that I have it? And so, M is that. All right. Everybody okay? Okay. Now that's the real structure. Now let's look at the virtual structure. Now what's going on with the virtual structure? Well, the problem is asking us to determine the vertical deflection and the, ver and the rotation at point B. So let's deal with the deflection first. I need to determine the deflection at point B. So I need to remove all the loads from the structure, right? And I need to put a single load on the structure. The load has a magnitude of one, I put it at B because I'm interested in finding the deflection at point B. And you tell me, which, for the real structure, do you think point B is going to go up or down when I bend this beam in real life? It's going to deflect downward, so put it downward, right? So now we have an entirely new structural analysis problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, I got that. Great. Let's look at something else. So here's the virtual structure. For displacement at B. And we'll say assumed downward. Okay, so now here's the beam. Here's our support conditions. Roller. And a hinge. And now what we're doing is we're saying, okay, point B is right here. I'm assuming it downwards. So I removed all the loads and I place a single load of 1.0. That's it. Just that. Okay. 
And now I need to determine new reactions, new shear diagram, new moment diagram. So let's call this, I don't know, AY like that. Let's call it BY. So I'll use little letters to indicate that they're not the same reactions as the one before. Oh, sorry, that's CY. That's CY. Okay, and this dimension here is 10 feet. This dimension is 20 feet. Now, with this problem, the uh, reactions are not, or sorry, it's not going to be symmetric, right? It's not going to be like half and half. I'm not going to be able to just look at it and go, oh, it's half and half. So I'm going to sum moments. Okay, I'm going to sum moments today. And again, if I'm going too fast, you tell me to stop. But I'm hoping that like some of the like the reactions and stuff like that, I'm hoping that's uh, pretty uh, simple at this point. So we're going to sum moments today. So we got 1 times 10, right? So 1 times 10 equals CY times 30. So 10 equals CY times 30. So CY is a third. Is that all right? And if CY is a third, what's AY going to be? Two thirds. Okay. I think we're getting somewhere. So we'll we'll be diligent. We'll say sum of forces in the y direction, a y two thirds up. Okay. What's the shear diagram look like? Remember, we're using a little v. What's the shear diagram look like? I start at zero, go up two thirds over, down to what? Over zero, right? So, Different shear diagram. Ooh, how many moment functions are we going to need to define the moment diagram for this problem? Two. Two. Interesting. So what's going to happen over here is we're going to have an M1 and an M2. All right? We're going to have to deal with that. That's going to be different. Let's just keep that in the back of our heads. Okay. What are the areas of these two rectangles going to be? This is 2 thirds times 10, so that's what, 20 thirds? This is negative 20 thirds? Did I get that right? Negative 1 third times 20, right? So we'll say... We'll say that. So... What's our moment diagram look like? Two lines, right? We go up 20 thirds, back down to zero. Okay. Now, remind me, what's the slope of this line? What's the slope of this line? Negative one third. Okay.
Okay. Now, with this problem, I propose that there is two ways that you could determine the moment function. The first is to cut a section, look to the left, cut a section, look to the left. We'd have to cut two sections. Why do we got to cut two sections? Because there's two moment functions. I'm lazy. I don't like doing that. These are lines. Can we interpret some things? Now remember, this is a coordinate system. This is the y-axis. This is the x-axis. Can we interpret something? Let's look at this function right here. What is the slope of that line? Hold on. Is there a point that it goes through that you know the coordinates of? What are the coordinates of this point right there? Zero, zero. Can you tell me the equation of a line that has a slope of two-thirds and passes through the point zero comma zero? Two-thirds x, right? Right? Y minus y1 equals slope times x minus x1, right? But y also equals mx plus b. That's the y-intercept, right? So I propose that m1 is 2 thirds x. And what is the region in which that equation is um, relevant? No. 0 to 10 along the x-axis, right? This is a great point, okay? When we're talking about the range, we're saying this is x equals 0, this is x equals 10, this is x equals 30. So this expression is valid from 0 to 10. So... Now, what about M2? What's the slope? Negative one-third. One and what about a point? Now, 30, zero. What did you say? So you were, okay, all right, let's talk about that, okay? He says 30 comma zero, right? So there's two points. There's 30 comma 0. Now, follow that. What are the coordinates of the point? 10 comma 20 thirds, right? And we're talking about point coordinate, right? Now, here's the thing. I don't know about you, but I'm lazy, okay? And if I'm plugging stuff into formulas, I like dealing with zeros, right? Because when I plug stuff into, into formulas with zeros and I multiply stuff, I get more zeros. And zeros are easy to deal with. They're easy to multiply, easy to add. So I'm going to use this point right here. I'm going to say... 30 comma 0. Because when I plug it into the adjacent formula, it's going to be a lot easier to deal with. Because my formula is going to be, and you can use y's uh, however you want. You can say, let, you, uh, what I like to do is say m minus m1 equal, let's use y's, let's use y's, because I think that's probably what you're familiar with. I am going to use the word slope and not m because I don't want to confuse it with that. You know, So I'm just going to use y minus y1 equals the slope times x minus x1. Then I get y minus 0. And I get this. So cleaning this up a little bit. Ten minus x over three. 
just flipped it around. Is that okay? Everybody okay with that? See how we're doing on time. I don't want to rush. Okay, we're doing good. I'm going to stop for a second and see if anybody has any questions on this. Very good. Now, what's the range of applicability? Say it again. 10 to what? 10 to 30, right? So this is 10 minus x over 3 from 10 to 30. These are our functions. Is that this is what we've got so far that fully defines everything. Is that fair? Now, can we test to see whether or not these are right? Yeah, we can pop them in Excel. So I'll show you something real quick. And we can do this quick and dirty just to see if this is going to work out. Did I turn this on? Yep. Let's just see if they look right. How long was the beam? So, let's zoom in a little bit. So let's do our real one first, and what did we say? No, the real one. 18x minus... 0.6 times x squared, right? Insert, scatter, do that. Does that look right? What's the maximum? Was that about 135? Isn't that what we got? Right? Now, what about the little ones? Okay, let's do the little ones. So now the little ones, we got two functions, right? So the first one is 2 thirds times x. And that one only goes from 0 to 10, right? And technically, we could insert another 10 row and see if we get the same value at both rows. But past that, we get... 10 minus that divided by 3. And it goes to 0. What happens if we plot that? That looks right too, doesn't it? Looks like we, the functions are match. Like right? We did them graphically, we did them algebraically, and we got the same answer. Sound good? Okay. All right. So that's just us spot checking. That's just us being engineers. Okay. All right. I'm going to take a second because I know I'm going a little fast here. I want to see if this makes sense. Everybody got any questions? Then we're going to start employing the method of virtual work. Sound good? Okay. Let's do the method of virtual work. So, here, let me... I got, I got room, and I got them written over here on the board. Okay, the method of virtual work. All right, now, does anybody remember what E was and what I was? Answers to the fourth. All right. Now, ultimately, what we need to do to compute this deflection is we need to sum up a bunch of integrals. All right? All it requires is a little bit of bookkeeping. That's all it requires. So, let's look at this. So let's do a region. 
How many regions are on this beam? Well, you're like, what do I mean? Well, I have, let's go, let's go back to the very, very beginning. Here's the problem. And we have one real moment function for the whole beam and two individual moment functions uh, for the virtual structure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say there's two regions, one from A to B, one from B to C. Okay. And we're going to see what happens when we start defining our integrals and, and defining all this out. Okay. So just follow along with me, okay? Region A, B, region B, C. Okay. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to report the range. Now, the range is basically just going to be AB. AB being the terms that I integrate. And if you're having a hard time following along, I think you're going to see this is pretty simple. Region AB goes from x equals 0 to x equals 10. Region BC goes from x equals 10 to x equals 30. So I'm just tabulating all of the necessary functions. So for each of these ranges, I have a different virtual moment function, right? For the first one, it's two-thirds x, and for this one, 10 minus x over 3. What about for the real one? What do I put for both of these? And it's the same one for both of them, right? Because this moment function works for both ranges, right? It's valid across the board, right? The beauty of technology these days is at this point, we can just plug everything into the calculator. And so what I'm going to do is ask you to do this. That's all I want. So what we can do, we can say, all right, hold on. We can say, let's break out the Casio FX 115ES Plus. And we can say, okay, let's do the first one. So we're going to do an integral, right? We're going to do an integral of, what are we integrating? Little m times big M. So... What do we got? Two thirds times. And now for the x, what you do is alpha. And then the right parentheses has the x term. Times. And now we got another one. 18 times alpha x minus times alpha x squared, and then we use the right key and it takes us from 0 to 10. Just do that integral, right? And so when you chug that out, you get 3,000. Who else got 3,000? Did I get, did I do it right? What's that? So this integral is 3,000. Somebody do the next one.
5,500. Do I have a second on that? I did not get 5,500. I got 8,000. Oh, remember, it's 10 to 30. Setting it up is the hard part. The calculus is the easy part. Okay. With me so far? You're shaking your head no. What's going on? For AD, I got 144,000. All right. Hold on. Hold on. You didn't get 144,000. He got 144,000. No, I got you, it. He's trying to find my mistake. Oh, okay. So he didn't bring the Casio FX 115ES Plus to class. That should be a minus instead of something. You also should put your multiplication symbol there between the 18 and the X just to be sure. Right here? Yeah. There it is. There it is. Everybody else get this? Everybody good? All right, so what we need to do now is therefore if I want to determine the deflection at B, here's all I need to do. What's the formula? What are we doing? We're summing up the integrals of little m, big m over EI, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say 3,000 over EI, and there's a reason I'm doing it this way, plus 8,000 over EI. What am I missing? There you go. What does that give you to, let's say, three decimal places? Now, if, I'm sure some of you are like, why didn't you just put that all in one fraction? There's a reason why. I got an answer. Do I have a second on that? All right. So what that did come up positive. So if it's positive seven nine two, and that means our assumption is correct, and we handled units. There's your answer. All right, I have two things to mention before we call it today, but does anybody have any questions on this? We're not going to get to the rotation today. That's not going to happen. Is rotation in our homework? Or yes, but, but, but don't worry. I, I have some discussion on that. So I might, if I have time, I might post a short video on, like, here's how you do the rotation. So it's, it's just another integration. Can I show you something real quick? She's shaking her head now. <laughs> All right. Some of you are saying, probably thinking to yourself, why didn't he just do 11,000 divided by these two? Okay, one of the things that's quite common, uh, and, and even in, or particularly in bridges, is to have beams that look like this. Um, and what, what would happen is you might have a beam that gets deeper in the middle because the moments get higher in the middle. So it has a different moment of inertia. So while what happens with a beam like this is even though you have moment functions that go from here to here and from here to here, and that's the case for both the real and the virtual, you have a change in stiffness. So how many integrals do you think you need to do for this problem? Not three, four. You have to do one from zero to 10, 10 to here, here to 34, here to 44. 
to actually have to um, to set it up like that. Like the M and the, so the, the the point I want to make is that these functions are not affected at all by these changes in the cross section, but you have to separate the integrals. So you have to do this. So you actually have four rows in your table, and so instead of just summing them all up, I was saying, okay, this integral divided by this ei, this integral divided by this ei, this integral divided by this ei, and so on and so forth. Um, so the other thing I'll mention, and this is going to be the spirit of the lecture on Friday, is that there is a much easier way to do this problem, and the trick is to exploit symmetry. What I propose that you can do is instead of doing four integrals, you could just do the first two and multiply the entire answer by two, and you'll get the same answer. Okay? So it's a lot less work to do. The spirit of the lecture on Friday is all about tips and tricks to make all this stuff easier. Okay? Now, your homework is due Monday. If you want a piece of advice, maybe rough out the shear and moment diagrams so that you know how many functions you're dealing with, okay? And see if you see any symmetry, any, you know, thing like that. Um, you could do the assignment now. Uh, it might be a little bit harder uh, uh, now than if you, you know, wait until after Friday, but I just wanted to uh, throw that out there. Any questions? That's all I got. We'll see you Friday.